Okay, um, this is lesson three of BVCN's transcriptomics portion. Um, this lesson is relevant to generating count tables for RNA-seq data. Uh, so these count tables record gene expression um, of across discrete regions of genomes and metagenomes. And by, by regions, I, I'm referring to, in this talk, I'll be referring to regions as features. And essentially what that means is if you have an, some kind of software that annotates your genomic DNA, it will sort of partition off parts of the DNA as uh, various features or coding regions uh, that depends, that, that differs depending on the kinds of data sets that you work with. For example, if you're working with bacterial uh, or keel, microbial, prokaryotic DNA, then your coding regions will be just genes. If you're dealing with eukaryotic data, then it's gonna be a little different because you're also dealing with uh, exons and introns. Um, so a prerequisite for this lesson is read mapping. To learn more about this, I recommend going to lesson four of metagenomics where Ella Tiratsky talks about what read mapping is. Uh, she also talks about read alignment scoring, the different aligner options, and, and does a demonstration of it. So when I say read counting, I'm referring to estimating expression based on how the reads map in the reference genome. So this seems like a fairly straightforward task uh, but as we'll see, there are some complicating factors that makes this a worthwhile study. Um, okay. So just a quick reminder about where we actually are in the broader pipeline of RNA-seq. And, and I, dis I discussed the same, the same slide actually in the previous transcriptomics lesson. Uh, so if you start with the total RNA extract of your sample, you're gonna have uh, total RNA. So here in this slide, I have mRNA plus rRNA. There's obviously a lot more different RNA species. There's tRNAs, there's tmRNAs uh, in there, uh, small RNAs. Um, but most of the RNA in a given cell is going to be rRNA. So the first step in your, uh, as, you're, as you're dealing with the samples is to ribodeplete the RNA, as, and that, that means getting rid of as much uh, rRNA as you can, just so you're not sequencing just rRNA over and over again and, and basically wasting money on, on sequencing depth uh, when you can just get rid of the rRNA using, uh, there's various wet lab approaches to get re getting rid of rRNA and I discussed that on the previous transcriptomics lesson. So you can refer back to that if you wanna learn more about that. So hopefully after you ribodeplete your rRNA, you end up with what should be mostly mRNA or tRNA and other various kinds of RNA that might uh, tell you about your sample. Uh, after this, you will shear and basically do your sequencing prep and then you sequence your uh, cDNA, the complementary DNA. And you'll end up with your sequence reads. Uh, most of them should be sense reads uh, and not antisense, although you have some antisense, I'll talk more in this lesson about uh, how to deal with antisense and sense reads when you're uh, using HDC counts for uh, recounting. Um, so here you have two routes that I laid out in, in the previous lesson, read mapping or de novo assembly. Here I'm just gonna talk about uh, not the read mapping, but what you do after the read mapping. So basically counting, actually counting the reads and, and uh, estimating expression of various genomic regions or features or genes. Um, so I, I do wanna briefly mention this publication, which does a really nice job laying out the pros and cons of various parts of RNA-seq pipeline. So in this lesson, I will mostly focus on one tool for read counting, uh, HTSeq. But there are others considered like couplings and, and flux capacitor. So if you feel like reading about um, reading about them and learning about the pros and cons of each aligner uh, and how they um, or these are the aligners. So if you want to learn more about the different aligners, 
uh, or if you want to learn more about the these quantification tools and how they perform uh, with various different factors that are associated with your RNA-seq data, like your sequencing depth or your read length, uh, I highly recommend uh, reading this reading this article. So uh, getting into HTSeq. So HTSeq is a Python framework, meaning that it's a, a Python package or library that comes with a number of scripts and tools and objects, uh, object classes that anyone can use to analyze next generation sequencing data. So this library comes preloaded with classes of objects that are specially designed to deal with sequencing reads and mapping information. Um, so uh, in, in, in this example, this, this is a, a figure from this, from this paper where they introduce HTC. So in this example, they, they basically just showcase one of one class of objects that's included in this Python library. And if you don't code in, in Python, if you don't really understand Python very well, don't worry about uh, really understanding this because I, I, I really think you need to understand more about how Python works and and just the, the basic infrastructure in, of Python to really understand what, what all of this means. So don't worry too much if you, if this is kind of, uh, overwhelming, um, but uh, as someone that codes in Python, this is helpful for me to understand how uh, one can use HTC or how it actually works. So, but in this example, we have a, a SAM alignment class, and this class is, is sort of broken down into discrete fields which hold their own subsets of information regarding a particular uh, SAM record. So SAM stands for sequence alignment map. So when you map your reads to a reference da uh, database, like a reference genome or metagenome using a tool like Bowtie, it's going to generate uh, what's called a SAM file. So a SAM file is a sequence alignment map and it has all of this information. Um, and Python is basically a way of, HTSeq is basically a framework that's designed to deal with this uh, file type and it sort of packages information, processes the information and packages them up into these discrete pockets that are then easily accessible uh, within the Python uh, script. Um, okay, so that's the SAM alignment class. Another useful example of, uh, of a class that's included in HTSeq is this uh, a uh, class called genomic array of sets, uh, which holds information on which reads overlap uh, multiple genomic features. Like in this case, you have two features, uh, A and B, and then you have your reads here. Uh, and you can see here that reads A and B, that both of these reads overlap a certain portion of feature A and feature B. So, so this is an important piece of information that needs to be considered when you're uh, evaluating gene expression info. Um, so one of the scripts <clears throat> or programs that's offered with the HTSeq framework uh, is the HTSeq count script. And, and this is what I use for generating count tables for gene expression comparison. And this is also what the, what the tutorial uh, will be on, the tutorial that will follow this lecture. So before going into the tutorial, I'd like to go over some key parameters that you can control when running HTSeq count. And, and I think these parameters are important uh, because they, they have potential to significantly influence the actual counts that you get back. Uh, so the first, the first uh, of these flags is the, the dash M flag, which controls how the program counts reads that don't land squarely within a particular gene feature. So this graphic is from the HTC count manual, and you can access this manual if you uh, just Google HTC count. And this is one of the first Google results that will pop up. So, so in this graphic, the cyan color, colored rectangle is counted in various, so this, this example shows how this read is counted in various mapping scenarios with various 
uh, modes, various dash M sort of options that you have. Uh, so in this first example, the top one, we see that read A does Lance query within the confines of gene A. So regardless of what you choose for the dash M flag, uh, this read is going to get counted within gene A. However, if read A or, uh, overhangs and part of the read does not overlap gene A, then you sort of have control and, and you can tell you can tell HCC count to whether either exclude or include this read based on uh, whether you choose union, intersection strict, or intersection non-empty. So you see here that if you uh, if you enter dash M intersection underscore strict into the uh, command line, into the command, this read won't be counted because it, part of the read does not coincide with gene A. Um, kind of similar here, okay, although here you have a portion of the read that doesn't overlap with gene A or gene, with gene A because there's some region that conflicts uh, and that region is within the read instead of being uh, at the edge of the read. So this is a different, um, it's a different problem, but you will get the same result if you choose the intersection strict uh, option. Um, yeah, so you, you, so you have a couple of other scenarios here that are laid out. Uh, the second flag, uh, that I want to talk about is the one that controls how the program counts reads that map to more than one feature or gene. So a few scenarios are laid out here, uh, but the bottom line is that this comes down to basically two choices, and that's none or all. So either you want to count both reads uh, that map ambiguously, or you want to count none of them. So there are other mapping software out there, or rather not mapping software, but tools that uh, estimate uh, the count count reads, like cufflinks, and and they, these appear to attempt to somehow split the ambiguous ambiguously mapping reads. I'm not sure how those algorithms work because I haven't really used them, but I, I generally consider that to be a bad idea, and I tend to exclude ambiguously mapping reads from the analyses. Uh, but if you're curious about how other tools deal with this problem, then I, I uh, recommend reading reading about that. Um, but yeah, so if you if you want to exclude and I, I believe the default of HTC is to exclude ambiguously mapping reads, but if you want to include them, uh, then you do dash dash non-unique all. So then that means that this read will be counted twice. It will be counted once for gene A and it will be counted once for gene B. So uh, in that case, you will have uh, an overestimation of overall gene expression. Um, if you're thinking about the data set globally. So the third, the last flag I'll discuss is the dash S flag, which deals with strandedness. So as far as I know, the current standard is to perform stranded RNA-seq, where special adapters are used that allow for discrimination of cDNA that came from sense strand RNA and cDNA that originated from anti-sense transcripts. So if, you, if you'd like to read more about the, the role that anti-sense RNA plays in the overall transcriptome of cells, I recommend reading this. Uh, this nice review, Gene Regulation by Anti-Sense Transcription. Uh, as, as, as far as I've seen in my data, about 10% of the entire transcriptome appears to originate from anti-sense transcripts. Uh, however, there tends to be, from what I've seen, anti-sense hotspots where a gene may appear to have more anti-sense transcripts associated with it. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if that's gene regulation or what's going on there? I should mention that I deal with some pretty weird data sets that originate from endosymbiotic bacteria. So these transcriptomes may not really reflect what free living microbes do in nature uh, and how important anti sense transcripts are. Uh, but again, I recommend reading this, this review. It's, it's really interesting stuff in there. So, um, uh, getting back to this flag, you do have uh, an option of specifying whether your DNA is stranded or not. Uh, whether your RNA-seq data is stranded or not, rather. So if you choose yes, then that tells HTSeq count that the data is from a strand-specific assay. So that means that all of the data that you'll see in your count table will, will only reads that map uh, to the 
sense strand will be, or the forward strand will be counted. Uh, if you choose dash s reverse, then that means the opposite. That means only those reads that map to the reverse strand are counted. If you choose no, then it'll count everything in the same table. So uh, it, it might it might get a little confusing, uh, but um, I recommend just playing around with these and, and seeing what the count tables look like if you have the data. Uh, if, if the data comes from a non-trans-specific assay, and you, or if you're not sure whether it comes from a trans-specific assay, you can run HCC count twice with the dash S yes and the dash S reverse. And if you see a 50-50 split, then that means that your data comes from a non-transspecific uh, assay uh, because you'll see an equal distribution of forward and reverse mapping reads. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, after you run HTC count, you should get a count table that looks like this where the first uh, column, it's just two columns, and the first column is your uh, gene feature uh, or your ORF, depending on the data set that you work with. And then the second column is you, the count. So basically, the number of reads that uh, map to that particular gene feature. So as you'll see that there are some gene features with no reads mapping, and there are some gene features with thousands of reads mapping. And uh, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about normalization of uh, of this data because that's a whole nother lecture in and of itself. Um, I do typically, uh, for my own research, I use uh, transcripts per million normalization. I used to use RPKM a lot. Uh, I've I've since switched. I recommend this publication. I know this is sort of one-sided because there are there are others out there that will recommend other normalization techniques. I just recommend reading about this and sort of the takeaway from this article is that TPM is a, a more consistent measure of, of gene expression and it allows you to uh, have a, a, a more fair comparison of gene expression if you're comparing different RNA-seq libraries. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, re about normalization here. Um, okay, so before moving on to the tutorial, I, I, I do want to mention again that there are other tools out there and that, that it's worth looking into alternatives before settling with, uh, with, with one like HTC count. So different tools tend to be tested with different data sets and thus are optimized differently and may work better or worse for your data based on the initial testing and implementation by the developers. So one, one notable tool that I've heard good things about is, is a feature count. I've never actually used, had a chance to use this tool, uh, but in this publication where feature count is introduced, the authors uh, actually do a really good job of showcasing their tool and, and showing it in comparison to other tools, uh, including HTC count. So they, they do do a comparison between feature count and HTC count. Um, So for example, here we see the performance of, of the read assignment tools. And we see that for the most part, there is agreement in, in where, the, where the reads map. And there is some disagreement. Uh, but as you can see, that this disagreement is really minute in comparison to the, the, the agreement, which is uh, a lot. So not, not too much of a difference. One, one big advantage of of feature counts is the speed and the memory. Uh, so it tends to use less memory compared to other tools and it finishes a lot faster given comparable data set sizes. Uh, and here they compare it to HTC count, which is the second fastest here. And then there's also uh, an R package called summarize overlaps that they compare it to, uh, which which looks like it's, it's the slowest and uses the most amount of memory. I haven't really used this uh, a lot, so I can't, speak to its performance except for what they um, except for what they mentioned in this feature count publication. 
Okay, so I think that that's it for the spiel. So we're going to move on to the Jupyter Binder tutorial now.